Hi guys, welcome back. This is Match Hat episode 451 featuring the, uh, I think, fourth, hopefully, and final installment of my interview with Mr. Winston Douglas Wood. In this part of the interview, he talks about his game uh, Starfire, as well as some games that he designed that were uh, supposed to be turned into games, but he doesn't really know what, what became of those. Uh, we also get into what he would like to see in a new fantasy game, if he were to remake the first one or maybe make a new one, uh, what his plans are uh, to get his games on GOG, goodoldgames.com, or maybe an Android version. A lot of great stuff in this segment, so without further ado, here is Mr. Winston Douglas Wood. Uh, so you mentioned this game already a couple of times, Starfire. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of I had a couple of tweets that were just like one word, Starfire. <laughs> so yeah. A lot of people want to hear about this. <laughs> yeah, well, it's an interesting. Ninety four, Starfire. Uh, it um, so the same company, Second Brain, as I knew them, uh, hired me to do Starfire, and the idea was that it was going to be a. Um, uh, you know, a more complicated and improved science fiction game. Um, and so I, I submitted them a full, a full design and a friend of mine, Arlen Harris, uh, worked on that with me. He designed, uh, some of the dungeons, um, or space stations, or, you know, what structures that space you can dungeons. explore. Uh, <laughs> And, um, again, it was even more so than fantasy four. It was, um, just hard for me to tell whether it was going to work as a game. Um, I had specified, you know, how it should appear and, uh, you know, how the gameplay should work, but it was really just kind of a big question mark to me as to how well it would work and it took them a while, but the, they sent me a, um, sort of a preliminary workup of some of the graphics. And then I started to hear from them less and less. Uh, and finally, they just kind of uh, stopped communicating with me at all. Mm -hmm. And I later found out that the company had gone out of business. So I thought that was that. They never published our fire. Um, they never finished it, and they just had, had disappeared. And it was only last year that a fan contacted me and asked me about Starfire and said he'd played it. His name was <laughs> uh, Romanus. It was the guy is his name, and I, I've just been emailing him back and forth a little bit recently. And I you told didn't him, even know the game would come out. I didn't know it was out, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> they never actually even sent me the last name. I'm just trying to uh, imagine what this must have been like for you. Like, I, I thought, oh, you mean Star Command? And they said, no, Starfire. And, and so, I uh, also I was surprised how, how was he able to play it? I guess he found a Japanese computer emulator and found the game somewhere online. Um, and sure enough, uh, there's some YouTube videos of it being played. And uh, yeah. I've, I've I, I watched this. I'm pretty sure we watched the same videos. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'd forgotten a lot about the design. And now I look at those and I can't remember if that's from my original design or if they changed it. <laughs> it looks like a pretty cool game. Uh, but yeah, I was sh shocked. It was just last year. I wow. found out that it had been made and I, I told Romanus. So you, I take it you didn't get any checks for this. <laughs> I didn't get my final check for that. Oh, <laughs> they owe me some money. Uh, but more than that, it's just it's just fascinating that that it came out, and uh, I never heard about it at all. Um, do you have your original design document sitting around somewhere? I do. I have I have the original design documents for it, um, just sitting in a box. Um, but I haven't gone through and tried to figure out what of those YouTube videos was uh, from my original design, and what wasn't. 
I, I can tell there was definitely some changes. Uh, so this is a some mech kind of game. My understanding is sort of you got this mercenary squad. Mm -hmm. and you do dirty jobs. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Like I said, I can't remember that much about it. I remember I, I turned that design into them probably in 1989, 1990. Um, and it's just hard for me to remember uh, exactly how it worked. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that's right. It had, uh, it had mech combat as part of it. And um, uh, you know, your name it, on it, right? When it pops up, doesn't it say Winston Douglas Wood, or am I just imagining? That? <laughs> I it might it might have my name on. I, I can't remember. I haven't watched the YouTube videos that thoroughly. Um, I, I'm just fascinated that it exists and <laughs> that you can still play it. <laughs> yeah, of course it, it pops up in Japanese, uh, so you have to kind of work your way through it. But um, uh, do you speak or, or read Japanese? No, no, I can't. Yeah, I can't either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you said that this was just you had a several i guess at least two maybe three more game uh designs i guess you submitted to them mm -hmm. never heard back or they didn't get yeah out. so what were those? Uh, initially i was uh pretty excited about this idea of designing games and not having to program them um and, uh, you know, even then it was becoming to the point where most games were developed by uh, a team of, of programmers and artists. And um, I knew I couldn't really keep up. So I was excited about that. And after Starfire was, was done, a different Japanese company contacted me to design a game. And the, design, the game I designed was... Um, I guess inspired partially by SimCity, uh, but was pretty much my own creation beyond that. And it was uh, the idea was that you would create a medieval castle, um, and you would it would kind of grow organically the way a SimCity does. Um, but you would also be completely responsible for designing the strategic uh, protection and you know, run, running the armies of the castle and. Uh, developing the the resources that they need and uh so i designed this whole complicated game and they got it and they're like uh sorry we, we're not going to do anything with this it's it's more complicated than we expected and so the rights were reverted back to me and oh well, that's um, good at least you got your the rights back <laughs> it was it was a it was a good lesson for me i Shopped it around to. I had to find a company that would not just publish it, but would would program it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I found a company uh, that was interested, and I sent them a copy of it, and stopped hearing back from them. But a few months later, they published a very similar game. So they had basically stolen my idea. Uh, yeah, I'd been paid for it, so it wasn't like I was uh, too crushed that by it, but it was a good like good it. lesson in uh, a bit sneaky uh, non disclosure agreements uh, have a purpose. Yeah, yeah, it was sneaky, um, but who knows how uh, how good that game could have been? Uh, I, they had made a few changes. I was able to read the the description of their game and. Um, you Just were a lesson to hire a lawyer, I guess. <laughs> tempted, but uh, got, just kind of got advice from people, and they said, you know, it's probably just not worth it. All right, so just a few. All right, so just a few last questions here, Doug. Thanks again for taking some time. Okay. Oh yeah, awesome. no problem. Uh, so, Fantasy Five. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you said in that interview back in 2013, you were working on this. Yeah, I did. I did some work. It's been a few uh, years. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I designed some stuff and uh, started to program it, and it just was uh, taking up too much of my time um, and not going as, as quickly as I. What were you using? Were you using to. an engine to do it, or uh... Uh, no? I was I was writing it from uh, on the PC uh, from scratch. Um, 
and it was it was taking up a lot of my time and um I started to talk to different companies about possibly publishing it. Um, it's just a completely different, you know, market for publishing PC games now than it was in the eighties. And um, it just became clear to me that it it, it was a long shot. Um, so it either have to be something that is a, as a labor of love that I could just do in a short period of time, or uh, I'd have to um, quit my job or whatever to, to, to do it and uh, didn't seem like it was going to work out. Uh, it's a shame, though, because I'd done a lot of design work on it and uh, it would have been fun to publish it. You never were tempted to take it to Kickstarter or Fig or any of those things? Oh. I could just yeah, see the pitch I, now. It, ma managing a team of programmers uh, and artists and stuff it's just not really my thing, but uh, hey, I, maybe it would have worked. Uh, maybe I could have gotten some resources and, and hired people to do it. Uh, but uh, a sense of what it would have, what it what kind of resources would have been required? Just, oh, are we talking? No, no, I don't. Millions or oh uh, no, tens it of would it would be a, a a couple million maybe. I don't know. Not not absurd, but um, still a lot. You know, I bet you there's probably enough fantasy fans <laughs> out there. I, I, <laughs> I don't know. I want to dip your toe in the water. <laughs> but you, yeah. you really like your job. Seems like I remember reading somewhere that you're really. So you're uh, you work in a, a KY pipe, I think is the. Yeah, yeah. So I'm uh, CEO and uh, lead developer. Oh. Uh, and so you one to leave that behind. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's 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 nice to be uh, to be self-employed. Of course, it, I have been since you know the the eighties, my whole life basically, and uh, now it's a lot, a lot more common. But um, it's a really nice thing to be your own boss and mm -hmm. and to work at home and all that. So uh, I wouldn't want to give that up. But you sometimes feel that itch. Yeah, yeah, games are, are a lot more fun. Um, and yeah, yeah, I definitely would. am always tempted to investigate the latest tools for making games. And um, yeah, there's some there's amazing stuff out there now. Um, I'm kind of surprised you haven't looked into some, something like Unity or the Unreal I, I, Engine. I, I have, not in 2013, but uh, I have since then. And uh yeah, there, there's some great things out there. Um, still a lot of work, though. Still, it sounds like you kind of enjoy the work, though, like creating your own yeah. stuff from scratch. Like, yeah, I do. I do. Um, yeah, you know, overcoming uh, the challenges of of the uh, what you know, computers that you have to work with and the tools that you have to work with are, are kind of fun and. Uh, Using something like Unity would be a whole different experience, but uh, you know, I still think about it. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is uh, two last questions here. One's from Robbie, also an artist. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'd love to know if there are any plans to re-release any of your games for modern systems. Um, like no, I, no, I can't. That the uh, you know, the, I, I don't have access to the, the original code anymore um and even if i did i'm not sure how useful it would be um if i was going to do something i think it'd probably be worth the time to just uh, like i said reboot the fantasy system and, and and redesign the world but uh still have the basis of the original fantasy games but that just <laughs> i kind of think of it are these are your games on gog Do you have some games on goodoldgames.com? Oh, there's various places you can download. Uh, you can download them. Well, we need to get those on on GOG. I think that'd be a good <laughs> first step. Just make it easy for people to buy these and have it all the emulator stuff set up. Yeah, yeah, you know, that would work. Coming like Beam Dog, maybe. Just kind of thinking off the top of my head here, but there's got to be some ways to get these. Uh, into some kind of online store 
set up for you so you could just oh, plant fantasy. Yeah. yeah, I never thought I never thought of it as a marketing thing. I, I like I said, I know that there's um different places that you can download the emulators and, and set it up and it might be a little work, but it's it is, you know, free. Um and I've heard from people who have done it. Uh, but yeah, I didn't really. I, I never really thought about uh, trying to market it. Well, I, you know, <laughs> free is good, but <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, you can make a little little cash, you know, and people, especially. Yeah, this is something I think Brian Fargo that was pretty smart about. Uh, he mm-hmm. did this amnesty program thing, and he's like, "Well, if you were one of the millions who were pirating Bard's Tale or whatever back in the day." And now here's mm-hmm. your shot for redemption <laughs> you know, oh, really? by the <laughs> by the the new version or whatever. Huh. Uh, I didn't realize he'd done that. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, we didn't really get into it, but I guess you there were probably people pirating. Uh, did fantasy have us? I know it didn't have the journal sort of system, but did it have some kind of copy protection scheme? That... Uh, the biggest thing that it had was um, for whatever reason. SSI had some guy write his own version of DOS, of, of the Apple DOS. Mm-hmm. And it was different enough that just about everybody who tried to uh, crack it was like, uh, you know, I can't, I can't read anything off of this. Um, but I, I knew people who did, who were familiar with that Apple, I mean, SSI's Apple DOS version and, uh, once once you got through that, there was no copy of protection. Um, but I think on the whole, it probably worked as well as anything uh, mm-hmm. just to have it in that different DOS version. I'm going to try to foist one of those code wheels on you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, the code wheel. All right, last question. Uh, I guess from Annie Vandermeer, who was herself, I guess, not too long ago. Uh, so she's... She asks, if fantasy were remade for the modern era, how would you see it changing, if at all? Well, uh, I'd, I'd like, to, of course, to update the, the the graphics and whatnot. You know, that that goes without saying. I think I, I think I could do a, a slicker job, um, even by 2020 standards. I could still do a slicker job, but. Um, Probably, if you look at the changes that came along in Fantasy Three and Four, mm-hmm. uh, I, I think I would implement those, especially like uh, during combat, having um, individual characters moving and, and that sort of strategy that that um, brings about, and the uh, having having the say the more complex uh, dungeons that you see, say, in Star Command, um, that that sort of thing. There's just more stuff can happen, and there's more character development, more game development going on, uh, because you have more resources. That's the main reason. Um, so the, the, like those practically changes, unlimited compared to the Apple yeah, two days. Yeah, it is, basically. Um, comparatively speaking, um, it's just amazing how much more you have to work with. Uh so if you look at the the changes from Fantasy One to Fantasy Four to Star Command, um, most of those sorts of things would be would be implemented. Um, but you wouldn't want to do anything radical. Sounds like a, no, a no, to three D right. or anything like. I don't think so. Uh, it's not like my three D would be uh, anything to entice you know people. I, I think the stick with the top view and the auto mapping and, uh, but improve, improve everything in uh, terms of how polished it was and whatnot. I'm trying to remember who it was. It must've been somebody from being dog told me that their, their goal with remaking those games is to make a game that make the game that you remember, but it's actually <laughs> much better. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought that's pretty good. good. Yeah. Yeah, if I if I were to do say uh, an Android game, that would certainly be simpler. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the the market expects a simpler game, um, so but it would more still be the Android market than the iOS. Um, well, I, 
ideally you could do both, but I, I would probably start on Android because uh, I'm more familiar with it. Um, so an Android game would be similar in uh, gameplay to say like Fantasy Three. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I would look at Fantasy Three maybe as a as a good record. I, I don't know if I would keep the uh, body parts thing. <laughs> Well, I got to break have... a lot of hearts, <laughs> break a lot of limbs. <laughs> At least I'd, I'd, I'd try to get a feel. <laughs> Not for break the a lot of limbs, I guess. I... Yeah, exactly. Uh, but that's that's about it. Uh, I know there's a lot of people watching this video right now, and they're probably like, "Make it, please, make <laughs> it, go on, convince him, Matt." We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll see if there's any comments. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we covered a lot of ground here, Doug. I really appreciate you taking the time. You know, is there anything else that you wanted to cover or talk about we didn't get to? No, no, it's been very thorough. Uh, I think that pretty much covers just about everything. Got it all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, thanks again. Yeah, this has been great. Very, real honored to get to chat with you. I've wanted to interview you for quite some time. Uh, well, so, thanks. Yeah, yeah, it's an honor to be, to be uh, chosen to be on your show. Oh, pleasure is all your, mine. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, thanks. That's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, should be back next week. We will be back with uh, Mr. Brian Hines. Really excited about that interview. I think you will enjoy that uh, a lot. Uh, of course, uh, you know, of course uh, also thank you uh, for supporting the show, for keeping uh, this interview series going and connecting. I, I hope to have the uh, audio podcast uploaded very soon when I'm done uh, with this. Uh, I also want to just thank you all, uh, each and every one of you, for uh, uh, not just for watching, but for uh, supporting the show on Patreon, becoming a Ratcheron. Uh, we're almost back, folks. You know, things have, uh, you know, it seems like things are slowly returning to uh, semi-normal, hopefully, for you. Uh, if you are in a position now where you're uh, back to work and, you know, not worried financially, you know, please do take a, you know, please consider maybe moving from that Rattling uh, level to the Ratron level. The way I calculate it is, if we get a few dozen people to do that, we'll be back to uh, three episodes a month, hopefully back to four episodes per month before we, we know it. But, uh, you know, if you're not in a position to do that right now, uh, don't worry about it. Uh, just focus on uh, yourself and your family, of course. Uh, and don't forget, too, you can support the show by uh, tweeting about it, posting about it on a forum somewhere, uh, even just liking the video. You know, all of that stuff makes a difference, and, you know, I appreciate your efforts. So uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, also, uh, while I'm at it, let me uh, welcome two new rats to the pack, Sean and Rupert. Welcome to the rat, <laughs> rat king's lair. Uh, don't forget about the Discord channel. Uh, let's see. Also, yeah, speaking of Discord, uh, so I did a live stream. I don't know if you caught that. You might want to check the channel uh, to see those. But, you know, I've kind of been thinking about maybe doing some live streams on uh, just for patron, just for Patreons or Ratrons. Uh, somebody had recommended that I do that with Discord. Apparently, there's some way to do that. You know, I'm kind of new to Discord, just kind of uh, kicking the, the tires on that, checking out what's possible. Uh, anyway, I'd like to know your thoughts, if that sounds like something you'd be interested in. Uh, do you think that would be fun? Or, or maybe just keep doing like these, uh, the ones from last time, or if you have other ideas, uh, just let me know. Uh, I kind of like the live streams. They're a little bit more uh, technically challenging for me, you know, as a... <laughs> You know, I don't know. I've yet to have one just go off without a hitch. There's always some issues with them. Uh, but I want to keep at it because I think it's kind of kind of fun. A little something different. But but anyway, do let me know what you think. Always interested in your opinions. Uh, all right, so what about that news from the Matt Cave? All right, a lot of great items here. Let's start with Knights of the Chalice 2, Revolutionize Old School CRPGs. So you probably played the first one, uh, Knights of the Chalice. If you haven't heard of that before, you probably skipped the Matt Chat episode I did on it. Uh, but the short of it is, it's really, really good stuff. You know, if you're a, if you're a fan of the old school uh, CRPGs, you definitely want to check uh, this out. 
Uh, this a party-based CRPG using OGL 3.5, turn-based combat, uh, emergent AI, 2D graphics. Uh, so he was, I think he was going, yeah, he's going for thirty-five thousand dollars, or he's up to thirty-five thousand. Actually, he only wanted sixteen thousand, so he's blown past his uh, his goals already. But his stretch goals are pretty interesting. And they're very, I think it's kind of a case study in like reasonable stretch goals. I mean, the stuff like uh, shortcuts for uh, spell casting and things are his stretch goals. Not, <laughs> nothing too far out, unrealistic stuff. I mean, it kind of shows the guy knows what he's doing. Uh, speaking of professionalism, uh, Pierre, I think, is his name, right? Uh, anyway, I love the way he describes this. I just want to read this to you. I think it's great the way he describes his plans. So we can envision graphical environments on, and creatures on a par with Temple of Elemental Evil or Baldur's Gate 2. We can envision epic music on par with that of the Conan films or Neverwinter Nights 2, Storm of Zeer. Uh, Zay, see, I, I never know how to pronounce that. <laughs> Storm of Z. <laughs> uh, and Mask of the Betrayer. We can envision a wealth of quests and companion interactions on a par with those of Baldur's Gate 2. And storytelling and dialogue choices on par with Planescape Torment. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow, I mean, the guy sets a high bar. Uh, so, love to see that. I mean, just the, you know, if all it had was music on par with the Conan movies, man, I would be in there. <laughs> like, take my money, Pierre. I want to hear the uh, music as good as those Conan movies. But, but anyway, uh, definitely go check this out. You, know, you could jump in on this Kickstarter. Uh, I'm not sure what it costs to get the game, but it's, you know, it's very reasonable, and I think you will agree. I mean, this guy's going to deliver something cool. Uh, we'll see if it lives up to that promise, but we will see. All right, item number two. Uh, there's a book out about the or this Demo Maker series. This time it's the Amiga Years. It's on Indiegogo. It's a book reflecting the best demos made on the Amiga from 84, 98 to 93. And they're talking about more than just crack trows. I mean, they've got the old juggler in there. The famous Boeing uh, demo, all the way up to like the space balls and <laughs> all this. Stuff. You know, you either know what I'm talking about and you're like, oh, yeah. Uh, or you're like, who? What? What's a demo? Uh, what? <laughs> uh, anyway, you know, I understand you, some folks probably won't be interested in this, but I think it's a really cool slice of uh, sort of gamer culture history, if you will. And uh, this demo scene, I was a. Uh, you know, really, I really love the music and the, and the, just the audio and the visuals of these uh, demos. But anyway, this is a 450-page book about it. 450 pages, full color. Uh, it goes from 84 to 93. covers about 90 demos. And the cost of this is 35 euros, which they estimate to be about $40. Uh, so definitely check that out. That will be on Indiegogo. All right, and then uh, lastly, we have a Lost Maxis Sim game. You know, there's a bunch of these uh, Sim games. I've got Sim Ant over here somewhere. There's a Sim Earth. <laughs> I forget. A lot of them are kind of wacky. Uh, but there's a bunch that were made for very special purposes uh, for, you know, for companies and such that just kind of got lost. Maybe they were in prototypes. Uh, but they found one on Ars Technica. One of the readers chimed in. They were looking for these, and they found one called Sim Refinery. It's a, one of PC gaming's most notoriously lost video games. and now exists as a fully playable game. Uh, so it's not completely finished. There's still some parts that don't work, apparently. Uh, but I thought this was really cool. Uh, they are inviting people to fiddle with a prototype and see uh, <laughs> cause as much intentional and absolutely educational refinery destruction as possible. <laughs> uh, pretty, pretty cool. Uh, so anyway, there's links to all that in the show notes. All right, so let's wrap it up with a quote, and I got a bit of a lengthy quote here, but I thought it was appropriate. As you probably know, sadly, uh, Mr. Arnold J. Hendrick uh, passed away recently. I don't have the date written down here, but I think it was uh, uh, last week. Uh, but as you know, we had him on the show. He was very honored. His first and maybe even only ever video interview. Uh, we talked about Darklands and a bunch of other stuff. Let's see, where's Darklands? Yeah, <laughs> got a copy here. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, but anyway, it's a really fantastic game if you could pick it up. Not just for the game, uh, but just the manuals and everything. I mean, this guy was incredible uh, in terms of the amount of research he did and his uh, writing skills. You know, you can read it in the manual. Uh, but anyway, uh, the manual, there's a section at the end called Designer's Notes. And he's talking in there about all sorts of stuff like the history side and what they'd put in and left out and so on and so forth. Uh, but this bit I thought was really cool, and I wanted to read it to you in kind of a little... 
a tribute to uh, Arnold, as it were, goes something like this. Uh, let us know what you enjoyed in Darklands. Well, what you would like to see in a sequel and what setting you prefer. There are plenty of possibilities. The Emperor in Germany has many political problems and intrigues. England and France are busy finishing the last half of the Hundred Years' War, after which England falls into civil war, the War of the Roses. Meanwhile, Italy is at the peak of its warring city-states era. Vlad the Impaler appears in the Balkans, the historical figure who ultimately became Dracula. Tamerlane is conquering Central Asia and much more. <laughs> What's your preference? That's just fantastic. I mean, really, any of those I think would be great. But uh, let me know what you think. Uh, we could have some fun with this question, I think. Uh, anyway, uh, that'll do it for this episode. Hope you enjoyed that, and see you next time. Crazies. End of the month, they're out of food.